This is Antarctica, nearly six million square miles of ice-covered wasteland, larger than the United States and Europe combined. Less than one-third of this great continent has been explored. Previous expeditions have discovered indications of coal, iron, and other minerals in this last frontier. Its mean elevation is 6,000 feet, but some of its mountain peaks rise above 15,000 feet. It is the highest and coldest continent in the world. In Antarctica, scientists hope to find the answers to many questions which will unlock secrets of the universe. The International Geophysical Year is a combined effort of scientists of more than 60 nations to gain knowledge of the Earth and related phenomena by worldwide simultaneous observation. One of the most extensive of all International Geophysical Year investigations is taking place in the Antarctic regions with 11 nations participating. In an effort to help find answers to these questions, the United States Antarctic Programs was conceived, and by direction of the President of the United States, Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd, veteran polar explorer, was named officer in charge. The Navy was assigned the task of logistic support for the program. Task Force 43 was organized under Commander-in-Chief Atlantic Fleet to implement the operation, which was assigned the code name Operation Deep Freeze. Rear Admiral George Dufek was appointed commander, Task Force 43, with the responsibility to construct bases, operate them, supply and resupply them, and transport scientists to and from Antarctica. The major objectives of Operation Deep Freeze 1 were to establish a main IGY base near the site of the former Little Americas and an air facility at McMurdo Sound, investigate Marie Birdland and the South Pole, for suitable scientific observation posts, to support a planned U.S. scientific program in the Antarctic, and provide logistic support for the United States participation in IG-1. The USS Arneb, AKA-56, Admiral Dufek's flagship, was one of nine ships constituting Task Force 43's ship group. The others were USS Wyandotte, AKA-92, USNS Greenville Victory, USS Nesplin, AOG-55, and the Icebreakers, USS Edisto, AGB-2, USS Glacier, AGB-4, and the East Wind, a Coast Guard Icebreaker. And finally, two yard oilers, the YOG-70 and 34, were each loaded with 270,000 gallons of aviation fuel to be used as Antarctic filling stations for the air unit. The Task Force Air Unit, Air Development Squadron 6, commanded by Commander Gordon Ebby, consisted of two R-5D Skymasters, four R-4D Skytrains, two P-2B Neptunes, as well as four de Havilland Otters, and six HO-4S-3 helicopters carried aboard the Task Force's ships. At the Atlantic Fleet's Construction Battalion Center, Davisville, Rhode Island, a special mobile construction battalion was commissioned by Admiral Dufek with Commander Herbert Whitney, commanding officer of the unit. These CBs had the responsibility of constructing all of the bases in the Antarctic. They were trained in cold weather construction. But the Antarctic, notorious for its unpredictability, will pose many problems for them. Here, Commander Whitney reads his orders, assigning him as commanding officer. Mrs. Dufek is accorded the honor of carrying old glory in the changing of the color ceremony. Miss Julia Hawks, selected by the crew as co-sponsor, representing the women who must remain behind, carried the battalion flag. Families and friends are afforded an opportunity to see some of the unique equipment that will be carried on the expedition. It's a 10,000 mile trip down there. And in three months, this weasel will be moving across the polar plateau.
Junior checks it out, while Mom inspects this tent. The roller will be used to build airstrips on snow-covered ice fields. A winterized portable building. This will be used on the trail for a mess hall and radio communication. In August 1955, the task of receiving, packaging, and loading the ships of Task Force 43 began at Davisville, Rhode Island. Here were loaded an estimated 20,000 measurement tons of cargo, bulk petroleum products, and the Antarctic life preservers, sled dogs. The first departure at Davisville in early September was marked by the excitement and sadness of farewell. Many of these families will be separated for over a year, and the separation will be spanned only by intermittent mail and wireless communication. From September until mid-November, this scene was repeated as task force ships departed from various east and west coast ports. On November 14th at Norfolk, Admiral Byrd spoke at departure ceremonies for the Arneb, Admiral Dufek's flagship. En route to polar waters, the icebreaker glacier passed through the Panama Canal, where she took aboard a load of bamboo. Later, at sea, the bamboo was cut into strips. It will be used as trail and supply dump markers in the deep snow. Other preparations for the expedition were carried on at sea. Here, sleds are being rigged. In equatorial waters, the routine was interrupted by the traditional ceremonies conducted by King Neptune and his court. The polywogs were put through the appropriate ritual of initiation required of all sailors crossing the equator for the first time. Among the Operation Deep Freeze personnel were several foreign officers. Here, they inspect the Navy's newest and most powerful icebreaker. In warm tropical waters, religious services were conducted on the open deck. occasion, the ship paused far out in the Pacific, while crew members took a dip and acquired tans that they hoped would last out the Antarctic winter. The crew of the little YOGs were deprived of many of the comforts and conveniences offered by the bigger ships. Here a line is shot for the vessel. and a high line is rigged to send supplies across. Two of these vessels were towed to the Antarctic. Life aboard them was rough, wet, and lonely. Thanksgiving Day aboard the ships was celebrated in the South Pacific, far from a supermarket. But the ship's mess tables were amply provided with a traditional bird and trimmings. The USS Glacier arrived at Port Littleton, New Zealand, December the 7th, 1955. Here, she was joined by Captain Gerald L. Ketchum, Deputy Task Force Commander, and Admiral Byrd. On December 10th, the glacier began the final leg of its journey to Antarctica, as hundreds of New Zealanders gathered at the pier to bid the ship and its crew a bon voyage. Six days later, the glacier received her baptism of ice near Scott Island when she entered the ice pack. December 18th, the task force sighted the Antarctic continent when Mount Erebus, the only known active volcano in the Antarctic, towering 13,000 feet above McMurdo Sound, came into view. The glacier moored to the ice, and its helicopter flew a survey party ashore to find an area on the bay ice suitable for a long, flat runway that would support the weight of the large planes of the air unit. 
Commander Abbey and Commander Whitney surveyed an 8,000-foot strip of ice at the south end of McMurdo Sound. They tested its thickness with a gas-powered chainsaw to determine if the ice would support heavy planes without skis. This site was found to be suitable. It was located immediately north of the 1902 expedition camp of Royal Navy Captain Robert Scott, leader of the second party to reach the pole. Food stores left here by the Scott party over a half century ago were found to be perfectly preserved and quite edible. The glacier then unloaded vehicles and materials for the establishment of a temporary base camp to support CB and air contingents until permanent buildings were completed. Some permanent inhabitants arrived to discharge their ambassadorial duties by greeting and entertaining the visiting delegation from the United States. The emperors are the best known year-round inhabitants of the Antarctic. Penguins are equipped with built-in toboggans for traveling over the snow. This Adelie penguin rookery was located less than one half mile from the glacier's moorings. 